Gomez, Mexican media fellow with the Sun, the School of Life Sciences. But before I tell you more about him, um, Bert and Alan suggested I tell you a little bit about how there might be a fit with both souls and the Center for Evolution and Medicine. Uh, when I first arrived at ASU a year ago, it was really clear to me that, I'll just put it this way, there was weakness in genetics. There's some really, really great people, but not very many of them. And I've been telling everybody from Michael Crow on down, we need to find more strength in genetics at ASU. And I think CEM can help with that, and CEM really needs more help with that. We have two wonderful people already as core faculty members in our center. Melissa wilson Sayer is, I think, you're someplace here. Um, and Ann Stone is sitting in the back. Um, but we need more, and I think we have a great opportunity to finally get to a critical mass of people doing real evolutionary genetics. Uh, Jeff is a very rare combination of someone who does quite deep theoretical thinking about core problems in evolutionary genetics, and also modeling, and also experimental models. And they turn out to be about disease very often, which makes it quite a nice fit indeed. Um, he's also an Arizona native, so we dare to bring him here. Um, in early September, other people would be frightened away. Um, he took his first undergraduate degree at a school that won't be named, but it's south of here, about two hours drive. Um, and interestingly, it was in both ecology and evolutionary biology um, and biological anthropology. He was supervised by Michael Lachman and Ralph Sean Charles for that work. Um, he then took his PhD in molecular biology and genetics um, at Cornell, co advised by Charles Lombardo and Carlos Bustamante. Um, he then did a postdoc at an NS NSF a Bioinformatics Fellow at UCSD yeah. at Berkeley. In 2009, uh, he moved to, or in 2009, he started the um, Jensen Lab at the University of Massachusetts Medical School um, in the program of bioinformatics um, and integrated biology. But then he took that lab and moved it to Switzerland in 2011. He's been at Lausanne since then. Uh, in that position, he's uh, published 65 papers total. He's had a whole slew of wonderful students and, and postdocs who have gone on to independent careers. Um, also, he travels a lot. And the way I know this is because I've talked with other ASU faculty who first met him at SSE in Brazil this year, and then at the Society for Electrical Biology and Evolution in Vienna. And then several of us saw him in Lausanne for the European Society for Evolutionary Biology. And finally, we can welcome him home to Arizona, where his talk topic today is the population genetics. Thank you, everyone. It's nice to have a chance to chat in front of this new center and to be home. Um, Randy gave some of the introduction. I just wanted to start off with a little broader introduction. Um, as he said, my career actually started here in Arizona um, at St. Joe's Hospital um, quite some decades ago. I was here through uh, grade school, through high school. Um, I'd actually known since I was 9 or 10 that I wanted to be an academic studying evolution. Um, if you ask my mom, she'll very, very happily show you some hand-drawn business cards I made when I was nine saying, Jeffrey Jensen, Doctor of Evolution. This is <laughs> her joy in life, showing these off to strangers. Um, so I had known that, but I was finishing high school, so as a 17-year-old, I started to ask myself, what should I do next to make this thing happen? Um, around that time, the Institute of Human Origins had actually just recently moved here, and so I called them up and asked if I could come in and talk to some people. And um, even though I never did any formal training here, in a sense, you could say that's how my career started, is they were gracious enough to talk to this high school student who came and said, I'm going to be a professor someday in evolution. Uh, what do I do now? Um, <laughs> and they got, gave me some pretty good advice, same advice I'd give someone who asked me that today, which is, well, you need to get some field experience. And when you go to university, try to get in a lab and actually do some lab work and have some experience about the actual research. Uh, this made sense to me. So I moved down south. Um, nothing personal. It was a good deal to stay in state and uh, far enough from home to feel like I was doing something different. So Tucson seemed like a good choice. I started off in biological anthropology um, for pretty much the fundamental reason that I thought that's how people studied evolution. I was a kid who liked evolution, and so I thought fossils were the way to do that. Um, turns out fossils are just one of many ways to do that, of course. And I started working with Emmy Morbeck and Steve Zagura, both of whom have since retired, and did an honors thesis on carpolestids. So these were a family of primate-like critters who were around 55 or 60 million years ago. I traveled to a lot of uh, museum collections at uh, Carnegie and Harvard and Yale, majoring tooth morphology to try to piece together diet. Um, during a primatology class in my junior year, 
a young PhD student, Brett Pacer, who's now a faculty in population genetics at Madison, came and gave a talk to our primatology class about this idea of population genetics, that there is another way to study evolution, and it's using DNA. Um, and I found this idea sort of instantly appealing, that you could take modern genomes of individuals and somehow look at that data and learn something about their past demographic history or their past selective history. Um, so this was instantly appealing to me. I looked up who his PhD advisor was. It was Michael Nachman. I went to Michael's lab and said, I like evolution. I know nothing about what you do. Can I spend some time in your lab as a volunteer? He said, sure. He let me work with a PhD student who was studying uh, malarial resistance in G6PD in humans. I learned how to do PCR, did some sequencing, some basic sequence analysis. The first year in the lab went pretty well. He recommended that I should consider a study abroad program to sort of broaden my knowledge of population genetics. Um, he recommended Brian Charlesworth, who's at the University of Edinburgh. Um, for those of you who don't know Brian, he's probably the smartest person, um, certainly I know, I won't say ever, but he's a clever dude, probably the brightest mind, certainly in molecular evolution that we have living today, I would say. Um, my time in Brian's lab had a huge influence. Specifically, he showed me that it's not one or the other. You don't have to do theory or experiments or empirical work. Brian is really a master of someone who does his own theory and then experimentally and empirically evaluates it using his own data that he's generating. Um, so this was clearly what I wanted to be. So as a 20, 21 year old, it was clear I wanted to be like Brian when I grew up. From there, I asked him and Michael where I should go to graduate school. He said Chip Aquadro at Cornell. That's where I went. I was co-advised by Chip, who's a empiricist, and Carlos Bustamante, who's a theoretician. For my postdoc, Doris Bachtrog, who's an empiricist, Rasmus Nielsen, who was a theoretician. So from this point after meeting Brian, I really wanted to ride this sort of divide between theory and, and data, and that's really what all of my training was. Um, as Randy said, I started my lab in 2009 at UMass Medical School. Um, around this time, I was becoming very interested in viruses as an application of the kind of population genetics I was interested in doing for a variety of reasons. Um, from a population genetic perspective, as you'll see today, in terms of looking across vastly different population sizes, mutation rates, uh, generation times, viruses have a lot of appeals, as I'll hopefully convince you. Moved to Lausanne in 2011, and in that time have had um, really a privilege to have 20 students and po postdocs come through my lab, a number of which now run their own population edit groups. Um, my lab currently sits here. This is Lake Geneva. These are the French Alps. It's not too shabby. And then finally, back to ASU. Um, 18 years after I first came and asked how to be a professor in evolution, I have the pleasure of coming back as a professor in evolution to tell you about my work. So this is a fun but long trip around to, to get back to Phoenix. Okay, so let's start with the actual introduction, now that our pre-introduction is, is finished. So um, let's define adaptation, since that's what I'm going to tell you about today. I'll start with the notion that adaptation is a mathematical process that can be described by rules of probability theory under um, certain model assumptions. There's some mutation rate, that is a mutation occurs with a probability, which we often call mu. It has some effect size, that is it can be good or bad or do nothing. It might be lost initially from the population, um, we can write that down. If it escapes this initial loss, it'll move through governed by stochastic and deterministic processes, which we can describe. And ultimately, there's some time to fixation, that is going from a new copy to a fixed copy. Okay, so it's appealing to say this is what adaptation looks like, this is the process. On the other hand, of course, adaptation is fundamentally a biological process, and there's genetic and biochemical and structural and ecological constraints that we have to consider if we want to understand how this process works in natural populations. Um, this is a handful of organisms that my lab has worked on over the years. And the point here is that the theory is great and the theory is right, as I showed you, but it's not just mutation X on background Y and environment Z. There's actually these other biological considerations we have to take into account. Or if we're talking about drug resistance in influenza, it's a specific mutation in, in neuraminidase that prevents drug binding. If we're talking about changing cryptic coloration in mice, it's specific changes in the agouti signaling pathway. So fundamentally, this is what my lab does. We like the theory, but we like to properly inform it with sort of proper genetics and proper ecology and proper virology. Okay, so when I say we do the population genetics of adaptation, what I mean is we use theory and statistics and genomics and functional analyses and ideally combine these approaches in some meaningful way. And today I'll have really two main premises. One, um, these approaches, this sort of combination is yielding really important insights into adaptation itself as a process. 
but also it's teaching us really important things that are giving highly relevant insights to other research communities, um, everything from ecology to virology, as I'll hopefully convince you of. Okay, so let's define a cartoon model of adaptation. Fisher <coughs> described this about 90 years ago in probably the second most important book in, in evolution ever written. <coughs> so let's just imagine we have some phenotypic optimum, which is here, and some current state of the population, which is here, okay, the wild type. In this context, in these two dimensions, it's really easy to define mutational classes. You have mutations that either bring you closer to optimum or keep you roughly the same distance or bring you further, okay? What we'll call beneficial, neutral, and deleterious mutations. With that, you can picture all new mutations that randomly occur in a given generation as something like this. You have some very bad things that bring you far from optimum, some things that may overshoot, some things that might keep you roughly the same distance, and maybe some things that bring you closer, okay? So this is just a way of visualizing in a simple cartoon form what all mutations look like with respect to this given phenotypic optimum. So, this next sentence is absolutely key. If you don't understand what I say now, raise your hand. When I'm talking about the distribution of fitness effects, which I talk about all the time, pretty much constantly, and certainly is the point of the talk, this is what I mean. I'm just taking all of these mutational effects and plotting them, where we have a bunch of things here that are very strongly deleterious, that's sort of these long arrows that take you far away. Those can be thought of as lethals. And then you have things around zero, which is around your current wild type. Some that are kind of bad, some that are kind of good, some that are roughly the same, okay? So this distribution of effects is the distribution of fitness effects, the DFE. Is that good for everyone? Because everything else is gonna be painful if you don't get that point right now. <laughs> okay, perfect. So that's the DFE of new mutations. But of course, you can write down the DFE of segregating mutations. That is things that escape initial loss and can actually be sampled as variation in the population. <coughs> and in principle, well, by definition, it's a subset of all new mutations, but in principle, if selection is working efficiently, you can just sort of trim this distribution. These things are lethal. They will not segregate in the population as variation, um, ideally. And you're left with this mode of things that are kind of bad and kind of good and neutral. Okay, so that's the DFE of segregating mutations. Then the DFE of fixed mutations is again, by definition, just a slice of this, and if selection is working efficiently, you like to think that the population can get rid of even the kind of bad things, fix all the good things, and then the things around neutral will fix with some probability, okay? This is a very simplistic worldview, but just the DFE in three different slices. So the outline for the talk is gonna be in these three parts. So we think about the DFE in each of these stages. So I'll tell you about the DFE of new, segregating and fixed mutations, with a few applications that have interested us over the last few years and will continue to do so. One in experimental yeast, one in experimental influenza, and then one in human cytomegalovirus. And I'll just mention a quick ecology example in the end as well. Okay, so that's where we're going. Part one will be the most brief. I just wanna give you a sense of this part of our research program, but I'm gonna focus on parts two and three more heavily. So this is thinking about the DFE of new mutations. Um, just in words, we've developed this approach with Dan Bolin, who's a biochemist at UMass Medical School. Um, we've worked with him for the past six or seven years. We've developed an approach termed empiric. This is extremely methodical, parallel investigation of randomized individual codons. That has little meaning other than we just wanted the acronym to spell out empiric at the end of the day. <laughs> and just in uh, a stepwise manner, this is what we do. We can generate all individual point mutations one at a time on an identical genetic background, okay? So the genome is the same. We take one mutation and change it and compare it to the wild type state. In that way, we can measure the fitness effects of each individual mutation, right? You can ask what is that mutation doing to fitness relative to the wild type? And then with that, you can compare between any environmental conditions you want and ask how the shape of this DFE changes with different environmental challenges, right? Are you extending this tail, shortening this tail as you change environmental conditions? And we can make mutations two at a time and start asking something about epistatic interactions between mutations as well. Like I said, I'm just gonna summarize a few of my favorite results in this area from the last couple of years, um, and they look like this. So here's just one example of an experimentally measured DFE from our work. So this is the same as the cartoon I showed you, a bunch of bad things down here, a bunch of things around wild type like here. In a neutral environment, that is an environment in which the population is already well adapted, so it's close <laughs> to the phenotypic optimum already. You see you have bad things, you have slightly deleterious things, you have neutral things, 
you really have no beneficial tail. That is, the population is already sitting very close to its optimum condition. There really aren't steps you can take closer to optimum in sort of Fisher's geometric model sense. When you challenge the population, in this case with high salinity, the shape is roughly the same, still bad things, still kind of bad things, but the real difference is you get this beneficial tail. You get a sort of tail distribution, and these are mutations for dealing with high salinity, right? So you've taken your population further from phenotypic optimum, and now in the sense of Fisher's geometric model, there are mutational steps you can take to make your population closer to this optimum condition. Okay, one other result that I'll just mention from this, so we can think about the cost of adaptation. Because we can make every single mutation and test it in different environments, we can ask if a mutation is good in one environment, what is it doing in other environments? Okay, so here I'm showing you the same DFE, except I'm just color coding. So blue are things that are strongly beneficial, yellow weakly beneficial, green are neutral. Okay. Then we can ask where they sit in other environments. And it looks like this. And the bottom line is that things that are strongly beneficial in this environment tend to be weakly deleterious or even lethal in other environments. This is what we can call a cost of adaptation, right? These aren't universally good beneficial mutations. They aren't universally adaptive. They're good in one environment, and if the environment shifts, they become deleterious. Um, and then just a sentence about our statistical work. We've developed a Bayesian MCMC approach to characterize this distribution of fitness effects from this kind of large-scale NGS data. Yes? This is all in HSP90, what I'm showing you here. Yeah, thank you. Others? This is in yeast. Yeah. OK, and then just a note on next steps here. Um, so like I said, this is a way to evaluate point mutations, challenge them in different environments in a systematic way. This is just to give you a sense of what the data looks like. This is literally just amino acid position, all possible changes, and then color coded by selection coefficient. So yellow is like neutral. The darker the color, the more deleterious. Naturally, some sites, like the first, have a lot of wiggle room. There's a lot of neutral changes. Other sites are very strongly constrained. Essentially, any change is lethal. We're now bringing the system from yeast to influenza virus where the experiment is very similar, except rather than the adaptive challenge being high temperature or high salinity, the adaptive challenge is treating the populations with drug. And then the experiment will proceed exactly in the same way. Okay? So that's something that's very much ongoing now. Um, this work has really been spearheaded by last, in the last few years by a postdoc in the lab, Claudia Bank, who's now starting her own, her own lab in Portugal um, and has sort of appeared each of these figures in um, one of these papers from the last few years in the lab. <coughs> Okay, that was a brief picture. Yep. That's right. That's right. Um, other questions? Part one? Yep. Just scale. So, how many amino acids were you able to cover in HSP90? So, in the work I was showing you there, it was 25. Um, we're now scaling with all possible changes at each of those nucleotide sites, not just amino acid sites. So, that's many, many mutations you're looking at. Um, we're now scaling it up to the whole coding sequence of the gene, and we're trying to get funding to do a whole genome, which would be cool. <laughs> that would really be the full DFE of new mutations for an entire genome of possibilities. That's sort of the long-term aim for that work. It's, it's, cost of, it's possible cost-wise, and it's possible um, manpower-wise. It's just we need a little bit of funding to get that done right now. Yeah. And robot-wise. And robot-wise, that's right. Yeah. So it's just growth relative to wild type, okay. right? So these are just grown, and so that's a direct measure of fitness in a sense, right? It's, if it's 60% worse, that's your, that's your measure. Okay, so part two I'll spend a little more time on. So that is how do you go from this distribution of all things that arise to this distribution of things that you can actually go into nature and sample as variation from the population. To do this, I need to introduce one basic idea that you're probably um, all familiar with which is it's not just a question of asking through time as a mutation increasing in frequency, right? We know positive selection can do that. We can have sort of big strong red dots and little weak blue dots in our population and through time if these red dots are leaving more individuals, um, more offspring, the red dot will increase in frequency. Fine, very Darwinian. But we also have this notion of genetic drift. We might start with the same frequency. We throw everything into our gamete pool. We take some binomial sample. And in the next generation, with the probability we can write down, we might go from five to six, right? In other words, the exact same observation through a very different process. So fundamentally, as population geneticists, we worry a lot about how to distinguish between these two processes. Um, and my lab is no exception. This worries us. 
so this is just a computer simulation to give you another sense. Um, because it's a binomial sampling effect, it's stronger as population size is smaller. So these are just simulated allele frequencies through time, so time going this way, frequency, and you see this sort of bouncing around as you'd expect, and more bouncing the smaller your handful of gametes, um, so here 100 versus 1,000. Just because it's random doesn't mean that you can easily distinguish it from, from selection, however. We see here an example, a completely neutral mutation that just quickly rises and fixes in the population, right? This looks like selection, but of course this happens with a probability when you sample 100 or 1,000 or a million mutations, this is going to happen. This is, not a, this is not a formal test, this is just an observation, right? So what does it mean to distinguish drift from selection in this kind of data? Well, fundamentally, we just need to ask, do we need an S? That is, do we need a non-zero selection coefficient to explain some given observation of allele frequency change? And ask, is this change too great to be attributable to genetic drift alone? And of course, this isn't a question you ask per genome. It's a question you ask per site. Some sites will be neutral and, and governed purely by genetic drift. Some will be weakly selected, either positively or negatively. So this is a per site question. I'll just show you an approach we propose to doing this. So this is a way to identify selected mutations from time sample data. If you just think of the information you have, this is just a mutation frequency through time. So time point one, two, three, and four that you've sampled. You have some basic stuff here, right? You have frequency at, mut at time point one, frequency at time point two, and what those frequencies are, okay? That's fundamentally the information that you have that you're trying to draw inference from. We propose this FS prime statistic which is just a way to capture this information in a hopefully statistically clever way. And the basic idea is this. So if you take every site in the genome, you have a distribution of these FS primes, okay? And this is the average change you're observing in your genome. You can then make a null distribution of this FS prime statistic, and essentially this is just taking an outlier approach. What are the outlier FS primes, and do you need something other than genetic drift to explain these outliers, okay? That's fundamentally all we're capturing here. I'll show you this. This is one of three complicated things I'll show you. So if you're going to focus three times, make one of those times now, please. <laughs> this is a one-slide explanation of approximate Bayesian computation, ABC, which you do a lot of. And it looks like this. So all of the dots are simulated data. This is just variance and through time of mutations that increase in frequency, variance through time of mutations that decrease in frequency. Right? If I say a mutation has a lot of variance in its frequency, it can be doing this, or it can be doing this, or it can be doing this, right? All of those things are a lot of variance. So this is just saying, is the variance going up? Is the variance going down in direction? So the red simulated data are beneficial mutations. They have a very high variance in the direction of increasing in frequency, as you'd expect. Green or deleterious mutations have a high variance, but in the direction of decreasing in frequency. Yellow is neutral. They have an equal chance of going up or down, as you'd expect, okay? So you simulate all of this data. This is what it looks like. And then for any given data observation in a real data set, like this one dot, right? You say this is a dot. This is the observed variance increasing and decreasing in frequency. You compare that with your simulated pool and ask which of our simulated mutations fit that observation. That's really all ABC is. This is approximate Bayesian computation. And what you get is a posterior distribution. That is, this is the range of values of S that are likely to explain that given data observation. That's correct. These are right Fisher with selection with some data ascertainment that SNPs have to get above 2% frequency. Okay, so at the end of the day, what you get for each site in your genome is a posterior of S. Okay, that's fundamentally how this is working. Does that make general sense? So you estimate, you actually estimate any as part of this process. I'm happy to show you after how that works, but you use that FS prime distribution as a direct estimate of any, right? Because it's actually a variance that gives you the estimate. Yeah. Okay, so I'll show you um, one example of this approach. This is really something that works on any time sample data. So we've also applied it to things like ancient DNA, for example. Anytime you have frequencies at multiple time points, this is a way of estimating S and effective population size. I'll show you an example that we're focused much more heavily on um, for the last five years through a DARPA-funded um, influenza consortium that we're part of. The experiment looks like this that I'll tell you about. So this is um, passage in MDCK cells. So here we have passage one, two, three. The exp experiment is split into passages that are not drug treated, are drug treated, and everything's done in duplicate, okay? The drug treatment in this case is also Tamivir, also known as Tamiflu if you watch infomercials. 
And what we have at the end of the day is whole genome time sampled sequencing data at 13 time points. So at each of these passages, we have um, whole genome population allele frequency data. The drug is always introduced at passage four and what I'll show you, we always have a control and we always have duplicate experiments, okay? This is the setup of the data that I'll show you next. So as I said, with this ABC approach that I described, this is what that kind of data looks like. So this is just walking across the genome. This is statistical significance. Sorry, you really can't see in that corner, huh? You okay? Yeah. <laughs> this is our statistical threshold of significance. So you observe, well, at least two things initially. One, most sites don't need selection to explain their observed allele frequency changes, right? Most sites are compatible, compatible with drift alone. You have a small handful of sites that are inconsistent with drift alone. That is, they're changing too fast, and thus we invoke selection. And they're not randomly distributed, but they're in NA and HA. And if you think about um, influenza, this won't come as a surprise to you, as I'll show you in a moment. So remind me what those proteins are that you're showing there? Yeah, so oseltamivir is a neuromindase inhibitor, and we actually know exactly where it's binding. And these mutations, I'll show you on the next slide, are actually just preventing that. So that's why they're, they're uh, inducing resistance. And so all three of those proteins are neuraminidase? Um, so this is just neuraminidase, NA. Um, and HA, there's a compensatory mutation sitting in, H, in HA for this NA resistance mutation. <laughs> yeah. So these are, that is that mutation that I'm referring to. So this is drug replicate one and drug replicate two. So these are just passage numbers and allele um, trajectory through time for our significant sites. You see that these mutations that we're assessing as significant take a very nice deterministic shape, right? This very nice selection looking S shape where as soon as they arise, this is the time of, that the drug is applied. Once they arise, they increase in frequency very quickly and fix. Um, the one in common between these two replicates is this H274Y, which is a known and previously described resistance mutation. So it's a nice sanity check that we're finding the one thing that we know causes resistance. But we also have a handful of other sites, one of which I mentioned we have very good evidence for being a compensatory site for this H274Y change. The other sites are identified are not yet known, but are being functionally validated at the moment. Um, at UMass. And then just to return to some of the yeast work I showed you, so this is our DFE for the influenza data in the absence of drug and in the presence of drug. And I'm just showing you the tail of this distribution, that is just the positive tail, the stuff above zero. And very consistent with what I showed you in yeast for this sort of control versus high salinity environment, here in our control environment we see nothing very strongly beneficial. In our challenging environment, in this case, in the presence of drug, we see this long tail. In other words, these are the resistance mutations that are popping up when you take your population further from the optimum condition. So very, very consistent with what we saw in yeast in a very different um, setup, and very consistent with ideas of Fisher's geometric model and distance optimum. These distributions that I'm laying in top, on top are just for any um, sort of Fisher's geometric model aficionados in the audience. These are some commonly proposed tail distributions for describing the shape of um, the DFE using extreme value theory. Okay, so to summarize some of this influenza work, adaptive challenges, in this case drug treatment, indeed disperse the distribution of fitness effects resulting in beneficials, in this case resistance mutations. Um, H1N1 adaptation, also Tamavir, has limited possible paths, right? We've identified a handful of mutations, <laughs> but they're easily accessible. These aren't multi-mutational steps that have to occur in some order. order. These are single or double step mutations that confer almost full resistance. Um, and current efforts, as I'll show you in the next slide, are centered around evaluating other more promising drug treatments. I'll show you an example of favipiravir in a moment, um, and also combination drug therapies. <coughs> Um, this work has been spearheaded mainly by Matthew Foll in the lab, who now runs his own group in, in Lyon, and Nick Renzetti, who's still in the lab, and has summarized in this um, handful of papers from last year. So a note on future advances in this direction. So this is unpublished data. It's sort of hot off the presses. But just to give you a sense of what we're looking at, so favipiravir um, is an interesting drug, at least from a population genetic perspective, in that it essentially turns up the mutation rate. So if you think about that um, as a population geneticist, that might sound a little scary that you want to take a virus and turn up mutation rate and assume that it won't just adapt faster. Um, but actually, things are looking pretty good. And what we see are indeed more mutations, but we're not identifying any escape variants. And we're actually seeing ultimate meltdown. So this looks like it throws it into a sort of mutational meltdown model. 
So here's the no drug control. You see a bunch of mutations bouncing around. Nothing is significant. In favipiravir um, treatment, also nothing is significant, but you see many more mutations as you, as you would expect. And as your population starts crashing and getting sicker and sicker from this mutational meltdown model, that is more and more deleterious mutations are coming in and the population is unable to get rid of them. You see this eventual crash at the end. You, you reach a time point where it just starts um, fixing deleterious things and this is what's shrinking the population size and ultimately causing extinction. We have not seen in any of our experimental replicates any population that has escaped favipiravir treatment so far. That would be very exciting if that holds up, of course. Um, but this, like I said, this is literally um, a postdoc in the lab sent this to me two nights ago. So this is new, but it's looking interesting. On the statistical side, we're extending this ABC statistical approach that I described to something that we're cleverly calling CP, WFABC, that is using change point analysis, where the basic question is this. Everything I showed you, I was saying that each trajectory has one selection coefficient associated. You can imagine that's not always the case. The change, the selection pressure might change through time such that you have one trajectory that actually is characterized by two different selection coefficients because of some change. This is important if you want to look at data and ask a question like how many sites in the genome change selection intensity when you administer a drug or when you withdraw a drug, you need this sort of statistical analysis. That is, let's look at every site in the genome and see which ones have changing selection intensity um, upon treatment. So that's the statistical direction that we're moving in now. Good that? Yes. So if you remove drug treatment. Yeah. Yes, we have that data also, but we've not looked at it yet. But that's part of the experiment. So we have... So that's the idea that as part of the treatment that you, how long should you continue? Yeah. That's exactly right. So we have um, a similar in the same setup where we administer a drug for passages 4 to 10 and then with, with, um, withdraw drug treatment from. And this is really where this is going to come in, right? We want to see which sites are changing in selection intensity as you're adding and removing drug. Yeah. Other questions for the moment? To have power? Well, there's a few ways to answer that. Of course, as someone who runs a dry lab, my answer is more, right? <laughs> more is the answer. Um, with at least two time points, right? Fundamentally, you need two because it's a time point analysis. You get OK estimates as long as S is constant and pretty large. Um, with three, you're pretty confident. If you want to estimate a change point, you, of course, need at least two on either side of the change. <coughs> Right? So with two, estimates are reasonable, which is why we looked at some sort of ancient DNA applications as well, where you don't have you know, 13 whole genome time points. You have three partial coding sequence time points or something like this. Right? So, so two is reasonable, and this is sort of in that, um, in that work. We have a figure just looking at different numbers of time points and different sequencing depths. And yeah, you do OK with less. Yeah, although if you go back. Mm -hmm. So this is r real data here. So this is just. So this is real data of uh, how it's derived, how it's organized. So this is just observed mutations in the data set going through time. What I'm plotting here, when it's not treated, and when it is treated. So you know, if you follow one of these lines, this is a single mutation, and that's its frequency at each time point that I'm plotting. And so at this point, you're seeing, you know, obviously most new mutations are going to be deleterious, and the population simply can no longer get rid of them, which is sort of this invoking this mutational meltdown literature that theoreticians have liked for some time. I think this is probably a pretty strong example of that. And we also see along with that NE, the effect of population size crashing through time in the population. Good? Okay, perfect. Well, let's go to the final part then. So how do we make this step from things that are segregating as variation in the population to things that are actually fixing, things that are um, appearing as divergence when you look at between population or between species data. In order to answer this question, we need a sort of philosophical shift in how I've been talking about things. So I've been talking both in the case of um, the DFE of new mutations and segregating mutations about drawing inference on the mutation itself, right? In the segregating mutation data, there was a mutation. We're looking at its frequency through time and using that to estimate S. When you're talking about making inference on fixed mutations, you can't do that, right? It's fixed. Every individual has the same thing. 
And so this invokes what we call hitchhiking theory. And this is how genetic hitchhiking works, which I'm sort of required by law to show as a population genesis, this figure. Um, and it looks like this. So this is five sampled chromosomes. These are neutral mutations. The diamond is a beneficial mutation. It arises in the population. It starts increasing in frequency. And depending on the rate of recombination, it will bring with it other neutral mutations that happen to be on the same chromosome. This is what we call genetic hitchhiking or selective sweep here. And at the end of the day, the beneficial will fix. You'll also fix things that are very close. And if there's recombination, other things in the neighborhood will be brought to some frequency, but not necessarily fixed, because you can recombine on or off of the selected haplotype. Um, we've worried a lot about this over the years, starting from my PhD, how to make inference from this sort of pattern and say something about this mutation based on this pattern over here. Um, you can see just visually there is a difference. If we look at this frequency spectrum versus this one where we started, in terms of linkage <coughs> equilibrium or haplotype structure or allele frequencies, there's a very large literature around this, um, and we continue to think about this, but that's generally the scope in which we're thinking for this kind of inference. As is often the case in population genetics, and this is the last complicated thing I'll show you, so use your last focus resource for this moment. Um, the best ideas really come from Wolfgang Stefan's lab, and the idea goes like this. So this is just a measure of linkages equilibrium and time. The beneficial mutation arises, it starts moving through the population, selective sweep, and this sort of peak here is when your beneficial mutation's at high frequency and it's sitting on a haplotype with many linked neutral things, okay? That is just the same as the cartoon I showed you before, right? This peak here is this pattern here, okay? At the time of fixation, this LD snaps in half because recombination events to the left and the right of the beneficial are happening independently of each other. And so you get this sort of M-shaped pattern of linkages equilibrium. There's this omega statistic, which is meant to capture this, where you're just looking at R squared values as you slide across this region. Um, we looked at this statistic um, some years ago now, capturing this sort of pattern, and it looks really pretty good. So this is a rock plot, so this is false positive rate and power. And what we see is for different selection coefficients, you really do pretty well identifying the beneficial site just based on this linkages equilibrium pattern. And by well, I mean you get an excess of 60% power for a 5% false positive rate. That might not sound amazing, but compared to frequency spectrum-based tests, it actually is amazing. This is extremely good news, I would say. And this is in a bottleneck population, so something that's usually very hard to identify selected loci in. Okay, so this is the sort of statistical framework that we're operating in when we talk about this sort of data. I just want to mention one application the lab's thought about over the last few years briefly, and then I'll show you our main application. So we think about Crypsis um, in a few systems, deer mice, beach mice, and lizards. This is a long-term collaboration with Hopi Hoekstra at Harvard and Brie Rosenblum at Berkeley and Suzanne Pfeiffer in Lausanne. They're all united by a very similar um, ecology, which is the soil color change after last ice age, and they've had to change their color if they want to inhabit these regions um, sort of effectively in any large numbers. Um, this work, I think, has really characterized how this mix of population genetics and functional analyses and experimental ecology can actually be used to both um, characterize selection on the phenotype, using this hitchhiking theory, identifying the underlying genotype as well, and then characterize selection acting on that genotype. And that's really what that work has done, um, and this has been a sort of long-term collaboration with those three groups over the years. We thought about that a lot some years ago. Um, our main focus in the lab now and for the foreseeable future for drawing inference on fixed mutations is actually in human cytomegalovirus, HCMV. Um, does anyone know HCMV? How many people have heard of it? Yeah, that's pretty good. That's about average, I would say, 10%-ish. Um, this might sound topically diverse. I just had a slide showing you beach mice and lizards, and I'm talking about HCMV. But from a population genetics perspective, the questions are actually perfectly in line, namely, you have a population exposed to a sudden shift in environment, either because the glaciers receded or because you've infected a new host. You have strong a priori evidence of a potential adaptive history. That is, we see mice of different colors that match their substrate, and we see resistant CMV. And we have the same desire, which is we want to understand the genetics of adaptation. How do you make a cryptically colored mouse or a resistant CMV? How many mutational routes are there to that ultimate phenotype? Right? How many routes are there to optimum? and what are the shapes of these fitness landscapes. So just a word on CMV. So cytomegaloviruses exist in primates, um, really all across the tree. Um, 
but they're very strongly species specific. So even chimp CMB, which we call CCMB, and human HCMB do not appear to be able to cross this species barrier. So they're really quite specialized um, to their host. Um, it has a zero prevalence of 30 to 90 percent um, across global populations. It's a DNA virus, about 240 KB. We've estimated 200 open reading frames. There's almost certainly more, um, but this is sort of a safe number that we feel like we can rely on for the moment. Um, primary infection is usually via muco mucosal surfaces, so if you're not born with it, you likely get it in daycare when kids start spitting and peeing on you. Um, and once you're infected, it remains latent um, and stays with you. So we focused on fetal infection for some reasons that will hopefully become obvious. From a population genetics perspective, this is a really interesting system because it's really just a model of um, population subdivision um, and population structure with migration. So congenital infections are very common. It's actually the leading cause of infection-related birth defects. And it crosses the placenta from mom and invades fetal tissue and compartmentalizes. By compartmentalizes, I mean it forms different populations and different um, organs uh, in the fetus. The, simple, the samples that we have are usually blood or urine or saliva, that is plasma compartment, kidney compartment, or salivary gland compartment. There are many other compartments, but we have a hard time convincing moms to give us brain samples, strangely. But that would be extremely appealing data to have, to have a multi-compartment sample, because we don't even know how many subpopulations there are in a single host at this point. Um, so there are many other compartments. These are the three that we know something about. So I'll argue in line, bye Ann. <laughs> I'll argue in line with what I've been showing you. This is really a population genetic model that we understand well, even though it's a different system. And I'll make an analogy here to sort of human migration out of Africa, where here's humans in Africa, here's CMB and mom. They move out of their ancestral environment into the fetus, into the rest of the world, and start colonizing subpopulations. They're not completely isolated. They exchange some migrants. And these subpopulations are not all identical. There's different selective pressures in each of them. So they're similar in these ways. There's a larger ancestral population, mom or Africa. Um, there's a population size change associated with coloniza colonization. That is, the whole population doesn't get up and move at once. Some subset colonizes. Um, and these populations subsequently, further, subsequently colonize further areas. So this is just a sort of general cartoon analogy to get your mind around this system. And there is some exchange of migrants between these subpopulations. OK, let me show you a few results on CMB that I think are interesting. So the first is just the demographic consequences of viral compartmentalization. So this is just a PCA showing you how these clusters fall out. It's easier to see here. And this is really just meant to show you the following. If you take samples from one host, you can tell the difference between whether it was sampled from saliva or from plasma. These populations look very different and discernible. In the urine population, it's a mix of multiple compartments. This is also not a huge surprise. This will become clearer on the next slide. There are compartment level differences in diversity as well. So this is just nucleotide diversity in urine versus plasma of a single patient. Okay. So these populations are distinct from one another, as we saw in the PCA, and as we see in levels of variation. Perhaps most remarkably, so this is FST, just a measure of population divergence, we see the following pattern. So this is sampled just a urine population from the same individual, so either patient B101 or B103, through time. Through time, they're changing a little bit, but nothing very strong. But if you compare between urine and plasma in a single patient, they have this huge FST value. That is, they're extremely differentiated. This is remarkable because I told you they all of the viral population infects from mom um, through the placenta. That means one population came in, and they differentiate so rapidly that by one week post-birth, these guys are already differentiated at this extent. Okay? So it suggests that these um, populations, these environments, are very, very different between plasma and urine. And in fact, they're so different that they're as diverged as samples from two completely unrelated individuals. Okay, so within one host, they're as different as between two different hosts. Okay, that's cool, I think. You don't look as impressed as me, maybe. Maybe a couple of you. Okay. Yeah. CMB is a DNA virus that has lots of repair, real low mutation rates, not like flu. 
That's right. How are you getting that much mutation in that short amount of time? I'll show you some thoughts on that, but that's still going to be a good question when I'm done, but <laughs> <laughs> hopefully a, a little offset. Okay, so in the same way I set up this example of look, thinking about human demographic history, you can also estimate the demographic history of CMV within a single host, right? So here ancestral population is mom. These are population sizes, right? So it enters first into the plasma and then compartmentalizes. So here I'm showing you one compartment, the kidney compartment is sampled through the urine. Okay, so here's what we can do. We can estimate the timing of this bottleneck. That is, when did this population change in size to this population? Turns out across patients, this is looking around four months in utero. This is only from five or six patients, though. It's unclear how much variance there is in this, um, to us at least. We know we can also similarly estimate the second bottleneck. That is, when does it start compartmentalizing this other compartment? And we can estimate rates of migration between and size change. As I said, this is just exactly analogous to people estimating, you know, out of Africa, timing a bottleneck and migration patterns. We can do this within a single host, because the single host is essentially the whole world in the sense of the human analogy. Um, okay, so we can start estimating some of these things, and this starts making some sense of our observed differences in, say, nucleotide diversity between different um, compartments, because their population sizes are very, very different um, from initial um, colonization. We can also think a little about the adaptive consequences of compartmentalization. So this is just a statistic for estimating um, the likelihood of selection along the genome. So this is just genomic position. If you look within the urine population, and the red line is significance, within the urine population, not much evidence. Within the plasma population, sort of weak evidence. If you compare between plasma and urine, you see lots of evidence. That is, we think that these SNPs are not just differentiating because of drift. They're probably differentiating because of at least some level of selection, um, presumably because the environments between these um, two compartments are quite different. Just another way of looking at that data, here's just a tree. So these are plasma from different patients, here too, B103 and M103, and urine samples from those patients, and a couple of others. And here's another way of visualizing this very strange result, which is the plasma populations from two unrelated patients group more closely together than plasma and urine from one patient. Okay, That's weird, if you haven't picked that up. And same for the urine. The urine populations between unrelated individuals are more similar than urine and plasma within one individual. Yep? So these are actually metagenome regions, right? <coughs> Mixtures of different mutants in there. So when you do this phylogeny, are you only looking at the six mutations, or are you doing some kind of So we're actually, we're treating each site as a, um, according to its frequency, as having sort of some probability of being fixed between subpopulations. So it's not binary. In this case, each site has a probability of turning up as a fixed difference because it's being taken as a metagenome, but we have population level sequencing. Yeah. Uh, do you know the relationship between the two patients being sampled? These are two random patients that presented at Boston Area Hospitals that have no clear relationship. Um, with the example of MS1 and MS2 here, this is a whole different story I'm not talking about. These are actually twins. So we have a whole other sort of twin comparison that's interesting here. Uh, I'm just showing you urine um, data from them for now. Okay. So just to summarize the HCMV work, because I'm about out of time here. So this is really the first population genetics that I know of, of, of the HCMV system. And I think it's really shown the clinical value of population genetic analysis in the sense that this is a clinically relevant estimate of the timing of fetal infection. In population genetic terms, this is just estimating the age of colonization. Um, the first insights in the genomic consequences in terms of level of variation of compartmentalization. Again, from population genetics perspective, this is just modeling population structure with migration. And also some work I didn't show today, um, pretty good evidence that infants can be multiply infected. And this is really just admixture mapping. This was unclear um, before these results, and it's still a bit unclear whether or not this even happened. And I think we have very good evidence that it does happen. Um, this work has really been spearheaded by an outstanding postdoc in lab, Nick Renzetti, over the last five years. Um, and all of this sort of collection of results is um, distributed across these papers. Um, a note on next step. So everything I showed you has looked at congenital infections. Um, we're gathering data now um, to look at horizontal infections. So having a large daycare sample where we have time points sort of at the start and at the end where we know that there is some CMV infection. In other words, trying to characterize this demography when it's not um, mom to, to kid, but kid to kid. 
um, and also in uh, immunocompromised individuals. I think the bottom line here, um, as I said before, these are providing really important, um, uh, really important clinical information, but also I think it's a really beautiful population genetic system. I don't know of many other things that move on this time scale in a natural population where we have such beautiful evidence of this sort of mutation, selection, drift, migration, interplay within a single easy to sample host. So this is a system I like very much and that we're investing in very heavily in the lab. Okay, so what's the big picture? So through this combination of theory and ABC and likelihood-based statistics and sequencing and experimental evolution and functional genomics um, and ecology, I think we're gaining some insight into what the shape of this distribution looks like. And specifically, we have this Bayesian MCMC and empiric framework to characterize this full distribution, um, an approximate Bayesian time sampled framework using um, polymorphism data to characterize this distribution, and a linkage to equilibrium likelihood based approach using linked polymorphisms um, to make inference on this part of this distribution. So, this is sort of the best single slide summary of the kinds of questions we think about in the lab. Um, and just for sort of the overly broad future direction slide, I would just say that for a lab like mine that's interested in studying adaptation, um, we have lots and lots of different kinds of data to look at now from populations with very different um, effective population sizes and mutation rates and recombination rates and offspring distributions, um, which is incredibly fruitful ground for the sort of indefinite future of studying the roles of these different parameters and dictating the rate of adaptation. Um, but also really shows the fundamental role of evolution in medicine, I think, um, where I think the two key examples from what I showed is this timing of fetal infection and also this sort of experimental and statistical framework for evaluating drug treatments in a really fast and, and I think cost-effective way. So with that, I'll just note funding. So this is a European Union and EU grant, which is funding most of our statistical and theoretical work. Um, three grants from the Swiss National Science Foundation, which is funding different aspects of the empirical work. And all of the influenza work has been funded by DARPA and will be funded in the, for the next five years by the U.S. Department of Defense. Um, data collaborators, Dan Bolin in East Biochemistry, Hopi in Mouse Ecology, and Tim uh, in IAV and HCMV Virology. And finally, our lab members, I mentioned most of them along the way. I didn't get to tell you mostly about what they do. We're currently three PhD students and six postdocs. Um, Nick, like I said, has been really fundamental in the virus work, and in terms of former lab members, we have two PhD student alumni, both of whom are now postdocs and six postdoctoral alumni, four of whom now run their own labs, um, where Matthew was really critical in statistical development and Claudia in Fisher's geometric model work. And with that, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you. experimentally, right? So we have more data than you have for humans, in a sense. Um, so we think they're extremely, extremely strong bottlenecks that recover very, very quickly. So they look, uh, yeah, very sharp and then followed by very rapid growth in most compartments where the plasma we think stays small. And we have, which I didn't show here, um, pretty strong evidence of stronger purifying selection in the plasma population for reasons that we haven't fully put together yet. Can you just give us a sense of how much those questions are um, sort of integrated into the way that you're uh, approaching this whole topic versus are they kind of just two separate pieces, the sort of theoretical and Am I a population geneticist with a medical application because it's fundable or do I actually care? <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair question, I think. Yeah. Um, so I definitely started off in a very pure population genetics background. Um, in fairness, I think you know, viruses, the initial interest was it allows a sort of range of parameter space to be looked at. And when you ask questions about adaptation, it just wasn't possible in humans or, or flies where I started. So I think the evolutionary interest was the initial one and very strong. Over the years, in the last five years, a lot of really our other data applications because I, mean, I think this is the future of, of population genetics in a sense, is using it to answer these kinds of questions. So I think 
Um, I was initially disliked it from a population founder model, and over the years I've become a convert that this is really the valuable direction for my field to go in terms of um, sort of uh, clinical implications of this sort of work. So I think my mind on it has changed over the last five or six years, actually. Yeah. Great. For your uh, Mendelvirus stuff, does it recombine in the compartments, or are they still one virus? They recombine. They recombine. Yeah. Have you? Which is helpful for hitchhiking mapping, of course. Right. Yeah. Um, so, is, do you, is there any thought on using some of these longer DNA technologies, like PacBio, to maybe try to get longer fragments that um, that you may not you know, can be more sophisticated with than just your frequencies? Uh, in terms of getting LD and half the type information. Yeah. More, more stuff to play with. Yeah, um, it's not going on right now. That's, I guess, a natural direction to go in the future. There's essentially not much of a reason not to do that, I guess. I mean, we have you know, 2,000 or 3,000 fold coverage for these tiny genomes, right? So, sort of for pop gen stuff, I'm pretty confident in our real calling, but it'd be nice to be able to do stuff with half the type structures more directly. Did you get a whole genome with one MacBio? I don't know, actually. Many people in this room know the answer better than you. I mean, it's about 250 KB. I wouldn't think so. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 To follow up on the previous question, I'm interested in what are the, the big clinical problems in CMV and so how can we bring evolution to bear on those, those problems? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So, why we initially were focusing on fetal infections is that's usually where there's some sort of deleterious manifestation, as it were, right? So in healthy adults who have CMV, which is many of us in this room, there really aren't, you know, um, there is nothing that you're trying to treat or get rid of in a sense, right? And fetuses, um, like I said, it's a, a leading cause of, of infection-related birth defects, so this is really the place where um, you would want to, to try and solve this problem. I also mentioned immunocompromised individuals, so we have some data from organ transplant patients. This is also a place where it can become dangerous. Um, in terms of what you could actually do, so first, I mean, I think we're very much in a, a quantification stage in terms of fetal infection. When does it happen? How does it happen? What do those population sizes look like? How much exchange is there between compartments in the first place? So I think we're in a somewhat descriptive phase still. Um, where the interest, of course, is are there beneficial mutations that are moving around between compartments? In other words, if you're you know, treating uh, a single compartment, is there any point in this because you're just going to keep migrating beneficials in from other compartments in the body, a sort of uh, um, subdivision selection kind of model that we're fitting here. So to me, I think that's a, an open question, how best to clinically utilize this data, frankly. I think, um, yeah, we've been very much focused the last few years on just understanding the population dynamics first. Is there any intuition about why some uh, babies would get the defect and why others wouldn't? Is there some way that you could affect the selection yeah. for the virus? That we have some insight on that. I wouldn't say it very strongly. I wouldn't even put it in the talk. But um, <coughs> I mentioned we have some evidence that I think is pretty strong on multiple infections. And there looks to be, for the samples we have, a pretty good relationship between multiple infections and some sort of clinical manifestation. So um, that's promising, but that is not yet near the base to say <laughs> publicly that's something we believe. But I think that's our best guess so far. And I think we have data that supports that. But that's very much something we're chasing down now because that's sort of the million dollar question as it were. Yes. Great talk. Can you give my population collection evolution? I would be happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I didn't quite follow you when you said you, you saw no signature of positive selection when you had the urine sample and the plasma sample, if you, but if you compared both, basically boom, that was kind of full of, I mean, but what's the idea behind that? Uh, essentially that these two populations are accumulating changes too fast to be consistent with our estimate of effective population size. Oh. So there's too much change, um, too much differentiation to be consistent with drift alone, we think, um, okay. based on our estimate of effective population size. So kind of the same philosophy as like a mcdonald Friedman type of thing? Yeah, sort of a, exactly, just yeah. sort of a between population and K rather than between species and K, that's exactly right. Are the mutations showing up in any one type of gene, either genes involved in replication, innate immune evasion, structural proteins? Yeah. Um, as you saw, I mean, in that plot right there, these peaks are pretty spaced across the genome, and there's a lot of them. So in terms of chasing down 
you know, these are our two or three really promising candidates. We don't have anything that really lights up like that. It looks yeah. like a lot of differentiation, but the problem there related to the last question is there's probably a lot of genetic hitchhiking. So if you know, 30 things were strongly selected, we might be fixing 200 things, right? And chasing those down is gonna be a lot of work. Yeah. So the approach now is really just more patience to see are there things that are commonly fixing, right? Because you want to identify the targets of selection, not the, the hitchhiker. So mm -hmm. by looking across patients, we, we can certainly narrow down that list where you know, maybe these five or 10 or 50 um, appear to be common among patients and the other 300 don't be. They seem to be randomly distributed between patients. So we need to narrow down this down to. It is one o'clock. Can I just see how many other questions are on offer? One, Why don't two. we take these, these three and then we'll stop. Okay. So uh, the viruses are going from different tissues, uh, um, kidney and other places. And does that affect <coughs> the virus to growth and therefore the rates of mutations? So is there a functional constraint to how fast they can grow in these tissues? Different viruses can constrain growth and therefore mutation rates. Do you account for that in your calculation? I don't, we don't know a good way to account for that. Right now we're really just estimating what the population size is. Right? We have no estimate of why it is. It could be because selection is stronger, it could be because of a functional constraint on size. Um, there's the multiple population size value? Absolutely, okay. by a lot, by orders of magnitude. Oh, right. okay. yeah. Yes. Great talk. Thank uh, you. Uh, with your HSP90 stuff, mm -hmm. that certainly your choice of HSP90 was, was very wise because uh, it's one of those proteins that responds to environmental changes. I like it. Yeah. Um, the, but one of the things that is very intriguing to me, and I, I don't know if you actually looked at this, but it seems that it should be an important aspect, is that a lot of deleterious changes would be any change that destabilizes the three-dimensional structure, yep. whereas changes that are tolerated and probably even a subset of those that are beneficial would be restricted to the loop region. Yep, that's absolutely correct. And so you're you're seeing that track, and so when you chose your 25 amino acids, then that was in a loop, it was... It was meant to sample some of both. <coughs> and that's absolutely what we see, and even more interesting than that, I didn't show any of the epistasis data when we have two pairwise mutations, and you often see sort of it's one and one, right? Something that's deleterious tends to be compensated by, by the other. So I think we're sort of meeting basic sanity expectations in this kind of data, and those things that we expected to see were indeed seen. Excellent. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you.